Let us um, recognize that we have reconvened with all um, members present and uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and, and to, to the republic for which, which it stands, one nation, under, under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty, justice for all. I want to take as I as tradition is to recognize a few longtime Madison residents we lost over the past few weeks. Anna Alaka, a longtime Madison resident, died at her home on February 10th. She had just recently celebrated her 99th birthday. She's survived by her daughter Lena and her husband, uh, Ken of uh, Madison, and two uh, grandsons. She was predeceased by her husband, Antonio, um, and her son, Ralph and her six siblings. Born in February, 1923 in Italy. In 1955, Anna and her family emigrated to the United States, settling on Keep Street right here in town. And a few years later in 58, she met her beloved Antonio and the couple married soon after. They stayed in Madison to be close to her family and to raise their own family. And Salvatore Paolella, life, lifelong Madison resident, died in a, on, after a long illness on February 3rd, he was 84 years old. He was predeceased by his wife of 40 years, Joanne, in, 19, in 2003. Sal survived by his sons, Dean and Drew, and their spouses, and three grandchildren. He was born in Morristown, April uh, 1937, raised in Madison, the oldest of eight children. He, uh, after graduating from Bell he began a successful career in the United States Postal Service right here in Madison, rose to position supervisor, and after retirement, he worked with Meals on Wheels and, and our senior center in Madison and in Chatham for over 10 years. He was a lifelong parishioner of St. Vincent's. Uh, Dorothy Ann Cucuzzo, lifelong Madison resident, died at her home on the 23rd of January. She was 81, survived, survived by her husband, 46 years, Peter and her two daughters and her spouses and five grandchildren. She was born in December 1940, raised in Madison with her six sisters, graduated Madison High School, went on to uh, graduate from IBM School of Computers in New York City, and had a long career as a billing and IT manager. Um, and also I want to remember Ray Crone, who uh, died last month, the age of 95, while she moved from Madison a good number of years ago, she and her husband, Al, left their mark in our community. In 1968, Al took position of, of executive director of the Madison Y. So their family moved from Westfield to Madison uh, as Ray became a kindergarten teacher at Central Avenue School. During their time, initially, they bought a large beat-up colonial federal Victorian home located and still standing on John Marshall Lane. I remember seeing pictures of that. The fact that they were able to save that house was incredible. Um, and after they uh, restored that home, they sold it and took on another challenge, buying and restoring the Luke Miller House on Ridgedale, a home they actually restored twice, the second time coming after a fire on a Thanksgiving weekend. And rather than walking away from their, the, uh, the home, they brought it back to a great condition that it isn't, isn't today, that it is in today. And Al died in 2012. Uh, she raised, survived by her son, David, daughter, Lucinda, two grandchildren, five great-grandchildren. So let's take a moment to remember Anna Alaka, Sal Paolella, Dorothy Cucuza, and Ray Crone. And now let us pass our thoughts on the families and friends they leave behind. Thank you. All right. Um, can I have a motion for the executive minutes of January 24th, 2022? So moved. Give that to uh, Deb and the second to Maureen there. Uh, we already discussed. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We have no regular minute, minutes at this uh, meeting, so we will have that um, at the next meeting couple uh, of things. Happy Valentine's Day. 
I did suggest to my wife that uh, she um, sit at the dinner table with uh, some nice uh, candle, candlelit dinner and zoom into our meeting. And as I look at the attendees, I don't think she took, took me up on this romantic offer. So here we are on Valentine's Day. But I do have a Valentine that I'm going to show off here. And this is, um, says right here, we love forests. And it came from our friends of the uh, Drew Forest. It was uh, done, uh, signed by many people at the uh, a recent uh, farmer's market. So uh, thank you to the friends and for a very nice uh, Valentine. And um, a few other comments and announcements. We were enjoying spring-like weather and yesterday we waking up to more than a dusting of snow and today we had wind chills and Thursday it'll be around 60. So crazy month, but that's New Jersey. Don't like the weather, just wait another day. Um, and uh, as an update, um, we are planning to return to in-person meetings in March. So um, on March 14th, we will be back in person, uh, barring any change of um, things going on out there. Um, employees for the month of February, Russ Brown, building code construction official and lover of um, Hartley Dodge, Al Fish, plumbing code uh, subcode official, and Lou Amarato, building department assistant, have been selected as our employees for the month for February. They work together to locate and repair Stephen leak leaks in the Hartley Dodge Mo Memorial Garage trenches. With their knowledge and skill, these employees were able to successfully complete this uh, large project well outside the scope of their job requirements, ultimately, excuse me, saving the borough and taxpayers thousands of dollars. And that might be an underestimate. Um, we were looking at one point of having to redo heating in part of this building if that leak was not discovered. So it was incredible um, that they were able to do that. And um, our police chief, who we, um, had a, a resolution last meeting promoting or removing the acting uh, title. We, we will now also celebrate his 20th anniversary on February 26th. And uh, now I'd like to uh, present a proclamation. We don't have anyone receiving it, but I, um, so I will uh, go through this. And this is a proclamation for African-American History Month, February 2022. And um, as you'll note that this uh, proclamation uh, notes the many accomplishments that African-Americans have made over the years, but also recognizes centuries of oppression. History, which some may call uncomfortable, but history that must never be forgotten. History that we need to know and understand so that we can be a better country for all. So uh, some background here on, uh, whereas National African-American History Month each February celebrates the contributions that African-Americans have made to American history and their struggles for freedom and equality that and deepens our understanding of our nation's history. And whereas every Friday, February since 1926, African-American History Month has been celebrated in America. That year, historian Dr. Carter Woodson created Negro History Week, which evolved into Black History Month. And whereas in 1975, President Ford issued a, a message on the observance of, observance of Black History Month, Black History Week urging all Americans to recognize the important contributions made to our nation's life and culture by Black citizens. In his 1976, in this commemoration of Black History, the United States was, it was expanded to Black History Month, also known as African American History Month. President Ford issued the first message on the observance of Black History Month that year. And during, Whereas during African American History Month, we celebrate many achievements, contributions made by African Americans to our economic and cultural, spiritual, and political development. And these, whereas these accomplishments are, are more than remarkable, having been won at the cost of great struggle and sacrifice by men and women who came to these shores in chains and chains and then by their descendants. And whereas this is a time to also reflect on centuries of oppression including slavery, which was not limited to the Southern states, but was here in New Jersey and throughout the North. School segregation, whether it directly through legislation or indirectly through management, which continues to feed an education gap. And that the American dream of home ownership was made virtually impossible for those of color through redlining exclusionary zoning practices. Whereas former President 
Barack Obama proclaimed every American can draw strength from the story of hard-won progress, which not only defines African-American experience, but also lies at the heart of our nation as a whole. Now, therefore, I, Robert H. Conley, the mayor of Borough of Madison, on behalf of the governing body, hereby proclaim February 2022 as <coughs> African-American History Month and ask all to remember the impact African-Americans have had in our country while also we commit to a racially just future. I further encourage all residents to celebrate our diverse heritage and culture and continue in our efforts to create a world that is just, peaceful, and prosperous for all. There we go. And now we move on to reports from committees, utilities, Council President Landrigan. Thank you, Mayor. From the Electric Department, on Sunday, February 6th at 3.10 p.m., the standby crew was called to East Lane for a water main break. The crew marked out the underground electrical lines. On Sunday, February 6th at 9.24 p.m., the standby crew was called to half power at 23 Kinney, Kinney Street due to bad connections. The crew replaced all connections and restored full power. All electric car charging stations are up and running. Big thanks to Russ Brown. American Electrical Testing has completed the testing and inspection of our breakers at both the James Park and Kings Road substations. We are working with our electrical engineer on the beginning stages of the town's large scale solar project. Finally, the department continues to be busy with emergency markouts, new construction services, and the converting street lights to LED fixtures. Okay, from the water department. On Saturday, January 29th, the water department assisted the road department with snow plowing. On Sunday, February 6th, the water department repaired a six inch water main break on East Lane near, Cross, near the Cross Gates intersection with the assistance of the standby crew. The water pressure was reduced by shutting the main valves feeding the East Lane section and repairs were made. Full water pressure was restored in approximately two hours. Radio readable water meters are still being installed regularly. Anyone interested in having their to the automated reading system should call the water department to schedule to schedule an appointment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And public safety, Ms. Byrne. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Earlier this month, the Madison Police Department Command was notified by the Morris County 200 Club that three of our officers will be awarded meritorious service awards for their heroic actions during an August 2021 house fire at 265 Kings Road. Captain Joe Longo, Sergeant Sean McCarthy, and Corporal Stephanie Aquino will be receiving their awards later in the year for their life-saving actions in pulling the unconscious homeowner out of her residence and performing CPR, which ultimately saved her life. In January, Chief John Misha attained certification as an accredited chief executive by the New Jersey Chiefs of Police Association. This certification finds that the leader has the experience, formal education and management training, continuing education and collaboration, which is formally assessed against a recommended standard. This certification gives surety of merit in the New Jersey Chiefs of Police Association's gouging of effective police leadership through a model of peer review. Only 33% of all police chiefs in New Jersey attain this certification. So this is a really big thing. Two police interns have started during the month of February. Both interns are college students and are looking to gain experience in the field of law enforcement. And they are both graduating college in May of this year. They have a desire to enter law enforcement on either the local or federal levels and know that this was a great opportunity for them. Both police interns have been on ride alongs with the patrol division, and additionally, they are assisting with administrative work in the detective bureau and the records division. That's it for my report. Thank you. Community Affairs, Mr. Hoover. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, from the Downtown Development Commission and Director of Business Development, the next meeting of the Downtown Development Commission will be this Thursday, February 17th at 7.15 p.m. via Zoom. It is an open public meeting and anyone is invited to attend. May Day will be held this year on Saturday, May 7th. 
information on how to volunteer and donate will be released before the end of February. The Madison Farmers Market will be celebrating the 30, its 30th anniversary this year. It will open on Thursday, May 19th at Dodge Field. Vendor contracts will be sent shortly. For the Chamber of Commerce, the game Find Shelly, the Easter egg, will begin Friday, May 25th through Saturday, April 9th. Children are invited to search for Shelly and enter to win prizes. The Easter Fun Fest will be Saturday, April 9th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. The Taste of Madison has been rescheduled for Monday, April 25th at the Brook Lake Country Club. Cinco de Madison event is being planned for Thursday, May 5th. This will be a shopping slash dining event. More information will follow. The Madison Community Arts Center. The lighting grid installation will begin shortly and minimal disruption is expected. An art gallery system for the space has been identified and will be purchased soon. I'm gonna add something new that I have not talked about before. Uh, the Madison Chatham Coalition uh, is, a, is a group that's dedicated to preventing uh, and uh, substance abuse among high school children. A Night of Conversation is an initiative to support parents in raising healthy teens and power to make good choices, including avoiding substance use. The Night of Conversation encourages families to talk openly about important issues like substance and mental health. This year, families are invited to participate in a meaningful conversation at home at their own pace. Families will receive a kit delivered to their home that has all the essentials for a fun night in mental health and substance abuse, related uh, question prompts and tips on how to facilitate the conversation will be included as well as coupons, resources, giveaways and more. You can con get the information by contacting this link bit.ly slash MCC night of conversation. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. Finance Borough Clerk, Ms. Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. From the Finance Department, um, the Council has already had multiple financial presentations over the last few months, as many of you may have been seeing, and tonight we will begin the process in earnest. Tonight's our first look at a draft budget developed by the borough administration. As you will see, there are a number of challenges that the borough is facing, including continued revenue shortfalls and concerns about tax appeals from commercial properties in town. Voting on the budget, as we've said before, is one of the most important actions that the council takes. Our utilities build over 24.7, I'm gonna assume million dollars, Jim, in 2021. Our single largest budget line in the entire budget document is the procurement of electricity, when we buy, which we buy and then distribute to our residents and businesses. We work hard as a governing body to be transparent and to make information available. Tonight is the second of four scheduled budget presentations. January 24th, we had discussed the water and electric utilities. On February 28th, we will meet with department heads and hear from them. On March 14th, we will discuss the municipal budget again and review strategic planning guidelines. And on March 28th, we have one final discussion on the budget along with the introduction of the official state budget document. As per state statute, we take a four week break so that all residents have the opportunity to review that budget. Then on April 25th, we are scheduled to have a hearing and vote to adopt the budget. As a reminder, all budget information is available on the annual budget process page on Rosenet. And a reminder, we're also under state review, um, which would be the only thing that could possibly delay that final adoption. In other news, the borough has two major payments that are going out tomorrow. The first payment is the monthly payment to the Board of Education. This month, the payment is $3,634,154.75. The second major payment is an interest payment of $38,065 for the MRC debt. The payment is paid for out of the Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund. We still have a balance of $2,311,000 in debt associated with the land purchase and turf field project. This is, there is an excellent presentation on Rosenet that was given to council on December 13th, 2021 that covers the trust fund balance and obligations. That's all, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Public Works and Engineering, Ms. Ehrlich. Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, before I give my committee report, I'd like to mention something on the subject of the mayor's proclamation tonight, proclaiming February to be African American History Month. I wanted to encourage everyone to attend a special event this Thursday, February 17th. Uh, it is a virtual event held on Zoom, hosted by the Madison Historical Society and Mayor, the Madison Alliance for Racial Equity. They are presenting a talk by Dr. Walter D. Greeson titled The Enduring and Evolving Dynamics of Racial Segregation in New Jersey, from redlining to Mount Laurel and beyond. Since redlining, which was an exclusionary housing practice uh, that was mentioned in the proclamation that the mayor read tonight, um, it is one of the legacies of segregation in New Jersey and throughout the country. I thought this would be a really meaningful talk and something worth mentioning to members of the public um, and encourage everyone to attend this great talk. And thanks to the Historical Society and Mayor for bringing Dr. Greeson to Madison this Thursday. From the Borough Engineer, um, the engineering department completed the design and bid documents for the 2022 road improvement project for Howard Street, Norman Circle, and Shady Lawn Drive. The project was advertised on February 3rd, and general contractors may pick up bid documents at the municipal clerk's office. The bid opening for that project is scheduled for March 15th, 2022. On the same day, there'll be a bid opening for the MRC Accessible Trail Project. The engineering department has completed design and bid documents for the trail project, which was advertised also on February 3rd, and contractors may pick up those bid documents as well in the clerk's office. Tonight, the council will vote on resolutions to award Morris County cooperative contracts for road improvements in the late spring or the early summer under our mill and overlay program budget. We also have a resolution to award a design contract for plans and specifications for a new roof at the electric utility operating building at John Ave. The proposed contract is to the same architect who's developing design documents to replace the Madison Public Library roof. That's a project budgeted for the summer. And at Hartley Dodge Memorial Plaza, the borough is maintaining a fence around the worksite until it is 100% complete. Currently inspections, Contract and quality reviews are underway by the contractor, the borough staff, the architect, and the engineer. For the Department of Public Works, um, the borough continues to receive emails from residents thanking DPW and Recreation Director Zach Ellis for their great efforts to maintain the ice rink this winter. So I wanted to mention just because of the number of great shout outs and emails that the council and administration and departments have received that this has been a really su successful year. In fact, one family who's been skating there for 20 years sent an email to say it's the best the ice has ever been. So thanks to Ken O'Brien and his crew, uh, which Ken noted is comprised of several skaters and hockey players themselves for maintaining this outstanding family venue for community recreation. Styrofoam recycling drop-off was launched on February 1st and is going very well. In fact, another town contacted our DPW to ask about implementation and they're going to be following Madison's lead so we are proud to once again be leaders in sustainability and waste reduction in the region. In another example of town pride, the DPW has been improving the two welcome signs that greet drivers entering Madison on Main Street and Madison Ave. The signs have been repaired and repainted, including new lettering. The electric department is upgrading the lighting to LED and the DPW will rehang the signs in April. Since the last council report, we've had two snow events, one that required plowing. Our new snow thrower, which was purchased secondhand through an agreement with the town of Kearney, worked great. So thank you to our DPW crews for keeping our roads safe and clear through the winter weather. And finally, from DPW, our fleet services personnel will be taking an in-person class in April on electric vehicles and short-term charging. For Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee, thanks to the efforts of committee chair Kathleen Cacavalli, Madison has been paired with a Montclair State University student who's participating in the Sustainable Public Service Initiative through the PSCNG Institute for Sustainability Studies. The student will work with Sustainable Madison to create a specialized report for our borough called the Water Story to help understand where our water comes from, what happens to it as it runs through town and where it goes. The Water Story is the first step in a process laid out by Sustainable Jersey to help municipalities identify and manage our water resources. So congratulations and thank you to Kathy for connecting the borough with a student through this initiative to benefit Madison and enhance our resiliency as we face the increased threat of storms. I'll add a note to say that over the last 50 years, storms in New Jersey that resulted in extreme rain increased by 71%, a faster rate than anywhere else in the United States. Madison Environmental Commission continues to participate in site plan reviews. 
Thanks to the strong vision of Madison's master plan, volunteers have been referencing both the Madison master plan and the New Jersey energy master plan in their comments on proposed developments in Madison. The MEC chair, Claire Whitcomb, has noted that their reviews benefited from multi-town working group discussions uh, that enhanced the effectiveness of environmental commission comments on our site plans. So our EC has been a strong voice for um, making our, our developments in town greener and more sustainable. And finally, from Shade Tree, the Shade Tree Management Board has completed their 2021 annual report to the New Jersey Urban and Community Forestry Program. The report outlined 2021 goals and accomplishments, including forestry training, public education initiatives, and progress toward our community forestry management plan, such as enforcing our tree protection ordinance, removing disease-prone ash trees, and planting 112 trees through our public tree planting program. That's all for engineering and public works. Thank you and health, Mr. Landrigan. Nope, I think that's me, Mayor. That is you, I was just a test. I don't know why I'm not looking at, <laughs> looking at Bob in the lower right and uh, have a flashback of a few years ago, like, uh, last year. So anyway, let's try it again. And health, Mr. Range. No problem, thank you, Mayor. Uh, remember, annual pet licenses and retail food establishment licenses were both, uh, those renewals were both due January 31st. If you have not yet filed for those items, please do so as soon as possible. If you have already submitted a renewal and that came in the second half of January, you may not have yet received your tag or placard, but you can expect them by the end of the month. Now on to some COVID-19 updates. The holiday New Year surge uh, fueled by the Omicron variant continues to ease. Uh, this weekend, Morris County crossed back below a case rate of 25 cases per 100,000, down from a peak of nearly 400 last month. Uh, with continued vaccination efforts combined with the increase in those with natural and hybrid immunity, we expect these numbers to continue to decline. That said, it is important uh, and becoming more and more clear that COVID-19 will be continue to be among us uh, for the foreseeable future. The Madison Health Department continues to encourage residents to get vaccinated and stay up to date with booster doses as you are eligible and to stay home and get tested if you don't feel well. A note about masking, as many of you are likely aware, last week the governor announced that in-school masking mandate will be lifted as of March 7th. As a result, Madison's public schools will drop their masking re requirement at that time. Remember, masking is just one layer of protection among the many we've discussed throughout the pandemic, including vaccination. Some will choose to continue to mask up in schools and supermarkets and elsewhere, even without the mandates in place, and we should all be supportive of our neighbors, no matter what choice those residents make. The health department, as always, will work with our schools and the community at large, as this and any new guidance uh, is issued. Lastly, there are still some places where masking will continue to be required based on other state, federal, and local policies, such as in airports, planes, trains, uh, and other public transit facilities, uh, New Jersey state government buildings, and uh, the borough of Madison buildings as well. You can visit rosenet.org for updates on New Jersey's COVID-19 vaccination program, testing, and other pandemic guidance. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, my uh, unmute is not cooperated. Thank you, Mr. Range. <laughs> and uh, communications and petitions. Uh, yes, Mayor. Um, Mayor and Council received uh, several communications um, from residents with concern um, for a New York Post article regarding immigrants um, coming into Madison in August of 2021. That would be resident Kathy Daly, Dennis Schreiber, Susan Shriver and Lisa Sullivan, um, all on January the 27th. On February the 1st, Kenneth Sullivan also sent an email um, regarding illegal immigrants in Madison. On February the 2nd, there was an email from residents Jennifer and Eric Bauman on Ridgedale Avenue regarding purchasing uh, 157 Ridgedale Avenue for open space. On um, February the 11th, as the mayor noted, there was a Valentine state card from the Friends of the Drew Forest. And on February the 12th, an email from uh, uh, Lydia Chambers regarding Chatham Township's resolution in support of the Drew Forest. And 
another email on February the 12th from Christine Hepburn, wishing the mayor and council a happy Valentine's Day and offering her appreciation for your efforts on saving the Drew Forest. Thank you, busy uh, couple of weeks. Yes. And now we move on to invitation for public comment. This is the first of two invitations. Again, this one is limited to uh, the um, our agenda items, which is a budget hearing, draft budget discussion, and uh, fund balance. And then you may also comment on any of these resolutions. And please bear with me. It is a uh, heavy uh, resolution listing, uh, somewhat related to the fact that we had extra week in between. Um, so resolution 62 is uh, awarding contract for security cameras at Dodge Field to Johnstone, Johnston uh, Communications. Uh, this is not to exceed 26,500 and it's funded through ordinance 43. Resolution 63 is um, awarding contract for tree pruning removal services to honor tree service. And um, this is uh, funded through the 2022 Shade Tree Manager Board budget. Uh, resolution 64 is a uh, resolution approving temporary signs for a Thursday morning club. Resolution 65 is um, related to the council, the governor's council on alcoholism and drug abuse fiscal grant cycle. And this is a, a grant for $6,600. We have a cash match of 1652, in-kind match of 4,900. Uh, resolution 90 or resolution 66 is approving contracts uh, with certain state contract vendors and this we have a series of resolutions related to um, these these various um, purchase uh, uh, vendors so and the resolution approving resolution sorry my mouth's not working today resolution 67 is authorizing contracts under the Morris County co-op pricing council Resolution 68 is authorizing contracts under the Somerset County uh, Cooperative Pricing Council. Resolution 69 is awarding a contract to Helena Ruman Architects for professional services in the amount of $11,000. And this is for re-roofing of the utility building as uh, noted in uh, Councilman Ehrlich's report. Resolution 70 is for uh, paving improvements, Morris County Co-op bid not to exceed $510,000. This is also mentioned in uh, uh, member Ehrlich's report. This is funded through ordinance 220, 2022. Resolution 71 is awarding contract to Denville line striping under Morris County Co-op, not to exceed $40,000 funded under the same contract or same ordinance. Resolution 72 is awarding contract to Ravax uh, Contracting Corporation for crack sealing and not to exceed $40,000 also funded through ordinance two. Resolution 73 is approving contract award to maintenance smart for janitorial services in Madison Civic Center, um, water and light building, the police department, the community arts center. And this is not to exceed $23,000 coming out of the 2022 operating budget. Resolution 74 is um, authorizing the Friends of Madison Public Library in cooperation with Madison Rotary Club and the Madison Area YMCA to hold touch a truck fundraiser on Saturday, July 30th. Resolution 75 is authorizing shared service agreement with a uh, with Madison and uh, with uh, Mountain Lakes to provide IT services. Resolution 76 authorizing a special event permit to allow use of the portion of the Cook Avenue public parking lot by Madison Photo Plus for a special event held on May 5th through May 9th. Resolution 77 is a res resolution of uh, authorized refund of real property tax uh, prepayment. So it was a prepayment and then the house was sold. Uh, resolution uh, 78 is to uh, author open contract for uh, municipal court. And this is for the public defender for the township of Morris. Um, it is their choice, but it's higher to the joint court so we approve it and it's $100 per hour. Resolution 79 is authorizing membership in New Jersey Cooperative Purchasing Alliance. Uh, resolution 80 is um, purchase of security equipment from Back Talk of uh, Lyndhurst, the Bergen County Co-op. And this was uh, not to exceed $25,000 funded through uh, Ordinance 33-2021. Res resolution 81 is approving raffle license uh, submitted by the PTSO Madison High School. 
Resolution 82 is approving partial property tax exemption stat status for tax block 4302, lot five, effective January 1, 22, for wartime service connected disability. And Resolution 83 is approving Madison Public Library construction project and authorized execution of the grant agreement. And this is a grant from state of New Jersey. So you may comment on any of those many resolutions or the budget hearing, which we'll be hearing about shortly. Anyone wishing to comment on those things, please raise your hand by clicking the hand or star nine. If uh, you want to comment on something else, we'll be having a uh, another comment period coming up later in the meeting. And we'll bring up Tom Howard and POTUS. Hello, Mayor and Council. Tom Howard and POTUS, 27 Pomeroy Road. Uh, I wanted to comment on something from one of the reports from committees. Is that okay, Mayor? Uh, yes, since that was that has become part of the agenda, so yes, you right. can comment. Fantastic. So I'll use my other 15 minutes for the second, because I haven't been to four meetings, Mayor. So I'm just banking my cap. We'll discuss that later. So I wanted to comment about, <clears throat> I think it was um, Councilman Hoover who talked about a, a DDC meeting coming up. So I wanted to make a suggestion to Councilman Hoover to please have a discussion regarding uh, the parking situation in the central business district. Obviously the DDC plays a role in reviewing everything that has to go in the central business district. I happened to be talking to some merchants this past weekend and they were expressing to me the challenges that some shoppers and uh, visitors to the downtown have as far as utilizing different services during one visit. So one lady has a uh, kind of a, um, a parlor, or let's say a hair salon. And she said if, uh, if um, one of her clients comes in and spends an hour and a half in her parlor and then she wants to go out for lunch, she can't because we have a two hour parking limit in town. And I believe the reason we have parking limits in town is because there's not really enough parking on busy days. So a nice weekday from 10 to two is uh, usually a sign when the borough is gonna be very busy downtown for parking. Uh, another area of <clears throat> where a, mer a merchant mentioned to me about the challenges for some of her patrons to uh, do more than one activity is the yarn shop. So, you know, at the yarn shop, you have people that come and sit down and they commiserate and they, they knit and they do other things. And then after they finish knitting, if they wanted to go out and shop, and that's, that's one of the best buildings in town that somebody in the borough administration actually owns. And it's my sister-in-law who's actually his tenant. Uh, but if one of, one of those patrons wants to go around town and shop or eat, and they've spent an hour and a half knitting, they can't unless they move their car to a totally different part of town because they'll get a ticket. So I'd like us to address the fact that we do have some parking constraints in town as the town continues to get busier. And being busy is a plus. We wanna see the town busy. We wanna see a lot of people coming, not just Madisonians, we want them from Harding, from Florham Park, from Chatham, from wherever. <clears throat> and by us not making some additions to what we offer now, we're gonna deter some investment too in expanding in the residential um expansion of people living in the downtown business district so there is a lot of challenges and i think it's it's uh imperative on the council and the ddc to address how we can relieve these parking constraints and by just saying that we have a walking problem is probably not going to be the way to resolve this one, one, one minute okay ma'am i'm on it no problem um so mr mr hoover if you could please just mention that if you think that's important between the chamber and the DDC, I, I, I think if they walked around and they, and any of you on council poll, a lot of the merchants, they might have uh, a similar opinion that it is challenging on a busy day. You have uh, potential customers on Park Avenue who might not come to town for lunch because they're not sure that they can find parking easily and they'd rather just go down Columbia Turnpike to Florham Park where they have 2,000 parking spots and they can get lunch and take care of some shopping. And then I also wanted to say to what Ms. Ehrlich said about the, the DPW and taking care of Rosedale. I, I think they did a fantastic job this year. Uh, I, I did uh, just uh, nudge them a little bit also because I, I'm a big fan of our winter outdoor recreation 
option over at Rosedale. And, and I think that, that the whole team did a great job. So uh, thanks for, for making mention of that councilwoman early. Uh, and, and, and we're at time. Oh, right. Thanks. Yep. And um, thank you. Thank you, Tom. It looks like we might've lost you all together. Um, but anyway, uh, might've pushed the um, DDC report into an extended uh, comment on, on that. But, uh, you know, one of the things to be noted is um, there are different parts of our downtown which have a longer time frames, And as we work on the wayfinding and rolling that out, one of the key things that we're finding is getting people to to the parking, and also related to that is the um, the fact as we, as we look at the use of our commuter lots, is how can we uh, use them better? That um, you know someone could very easily these days park there all day and enjoy uh, knitting, getting your hair cut, having lunch, and uh, spending a whole day shopping in downtown Madison. So uh, thank you, some good reports, and uh, DDC will be looking at all those. Anyone else wishing to comment on any agenda items? Seeing none, I um, close this part of the meeting and uh, we now move on to uh, the agenda discussion and the budget hearing and call up our CFO, Jim Burnett. Hi, Mary, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen here, see if I can effectively do this. Okay. Wonderful, okay. Uh, as uh, my liaison and Councilwoman Deb Cohen explained, this is our second budget hearing. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, fund balance and municipal budget. Um, the proposed hearing schedule she mentioned, this is up on Rosenet and is attached to all of our presentations. Next up, February 28th, the department heads. So that'll be uh, in interesting. Anyone's interested, uh, come on down and uh, check it out. Uh, goals and important questions. You know, we've, we've talked about this and I just kind of created this first time slide. Uh, as a summary, and I think we, we've all focused on this, uh, but I wanted to get it down on one slide. But I think the main budget goals um, that uh, administration looks at are trying to limit tax increases, maintain services, maintain funding for capital programs, and ensure our long-term financial stability. Important questions to ask every year are, how is a municipal fund balance? That is our best indicator of our financial stability and uh, what impact will it have on the upcoming budget? How much capital can we fund in this particular year? Um, we are on a pay-as-you-go basis, which is um, excellent that, we, that we're not carrying a lot of debt and paying it off as we go. Um, and are there any abnormally large increases in appropriations or decreases in revenue lines and, and what caused them, what issues are out on the horizon? And then are there other issues to um, consider? So we'll, we'll talk about a couple of these things um, in the next few minutes. I want to touch on revenues. Councilwoman Cohen mentioned this. Um, municipal revenues, uh, we've talked about multiple times, uh, have been negatively impacted by the pandemic. Um, on our state budget document, and I normally don't like to refer to that because it's such an arcane document. If you can see me on my little screen here, it's this, this not great um, paper document that the state has us fill out. On that, um, local revenues are reported on sheet four. And they include most revenues um, except construction fees and cell tower leases. Um, this slide references uh, what they are on the bottom, annual parking, daily parking, court interest um, on investments, taxes, and sewer fees and the like. You can see the local revenues have dropped significantly and they haven't rebounded. We had an issue in 2020 where local revenues dropped and in 2021, um, they dropped uh, even, even more. And so uh, this is a continuing concern. Over the last two years, we focused on three uh, revenues, daily parking, interest on deposits, and court revenue. I want to say that there are really three different parking revenues that we get. The first parking revenue is permits. We're not talking about permits, but permit revenue um, is down compared to prior years because um, we um, looking for ways to entice people to keep their permits. Obviously, there's not a lot of people parking in the permit spots. Um, the second revenue that we receive is revenue from the Crescent. That's the parking space in front of the train station. That goes into a special um, trust fund, and that helps um, pay for the expenses because the, the borough took on that responsibility of that parking lot, which is owned by New Jersey Transit, and we are taking on the responsibility of maintaining that property. So that money goes into a trust fund and helps us uh, maintain um, that property. 
The third is daily parking fees. That is um, the typical daily parking fees that you, if you want to park um, over at the ambulance corps or behind public safety, a lot of um, daily parking fees there. As you can see from uh, this schedule here, oops, sorry, backwards, um, this line here shows the, the daily parking revenues that we posted in 2021 were, were just de minimis. Obviously, there are people, if people are coming and doing daily parking, the first place they go is the Crescent because it's the closest and, uh, and they're parking there. So the Crescent revenue um, is not included in that. Second is the court revenue. It's starting to come back a bit, but, but it's still $100,000 off from 2019. And then interest on um, balances to 425 we had in 2019 was really significant. And um, it, it's, it's down um, major. And uh, there's not a whole lot of indication it's gonna go up. Obviously, short-term interest rates are going up. So we're hopeful, but 425 may be a number that we never reach. So the end result is um, these three uh, revenue lines alone were down from 674,000 two years ago to 128,000 this year. So we're gonna switch and talk about fund balance. This used to be, we used to, used to refer to this as surplus. Um, municipal fund balance. Um, we were concerned um, significantly about fund balance last year because we thought, and if you see my little picture here, we thought we we're kind of coming down like a plane and are we gonna level off? It looks like we have leveled off. Um, there are differences between each of the three sources of fund balance, blue for water, appropriate color. You can see the water utility um, free balance um, has dropped significantly. That will probably level off and go up as the water rates um, that are enacted um, occur in the out years. Uh, the red is the Dodger maroon, I guess we'll call it, is for uh, the municipal portion. And you can see that's down and has not come back up. That's driven a lot by the revenues um, and, and the challenges we have there. The electric utility surplus, which is in the Dodger gold, um, and I guess electricity, you kind of think of as looking yellow, um, is uh, that, that has increased um, from, from last year uh, to this year in terms of free balance. But in general, we, we've, had a, we've had a leveling off. Um, this is exactly what the rating agencies want to see and exactly what administration was hoping for and wanted to see, that we weren't in this critical free fall of, um, of surplus balances. Uh, this is a big chart, and um, I realize that uh, there are a lot of numbers here. We gray out a bunch, um, but it just shows the um, what generates fund balance. The, the, the top section is kind of the income statement, the activity that happens throughout the year that generates fund balance. And this is for the municipal fund balance. And the bottom is, is kind of the, the balance sheet, what happened at the beginning of the year to fund balance and what's happened at the end of the year to fund balance. So... Um, you can see that uh, we had a major generator of fund balance in uh, 2021 was cancellation of prior year appropriations S4. What is that? That is money that was appropriated in the 2020 budget that wasn't spent. So we, we know that 2020 was a really odd year for um, the pandemic. And there were certain expenses that, um, that we had in the budget that we did not uh, have to incur. Um, some of those expenses were, um, were paid back through FEMA grants. So we would pay for $100,000 in PPE, but then the FEMA grant would reimburse us. So the net in the budget was zero. So um, those appropriations in 2020 go into what's called a reserve. And at the end of 2021, they lapse. And so uh, that, that's a Obviously, as you look at the other number, it's an extremely high number, and we don't anticipate to see that happen again. So, uh, our after using fund balance in the budget, which is this number here, which I think you can see the arrow um, circulating circling in the uh, bottom right corner. After we um, anticipate a uh, fund balance in the municipal budget this year, we're down to about a 3.3 um, million dollar level of what we're calling free balance, and and that is low compared to all these prior years, we were at five and 5.2 million in um, the prior years in 19 and 20. So um, in short, our municipal fund, our total fund balances have leveled off. That's good. Uh, the future of fund balance, we have to see. I, I really am hopeful that revenues start to come back. I'm really hopeful that we're able to um, 
uh, to to see a a longer trend that the fund balance will um, level off. Rateable base is the other concern, um, and Councilwoman Cohn mentioned this, and we've talked about this before. We actually, um, this is a slide that I've uh, shown before. I lived in town my whole life. I rarely got into Geralda Farms. Um, this is the corner of Lawanica and, uh, uh, and Woodland Road, pretty obvious building from the from the curb, but there are other buildings in Geralda Farms that are very hard to see, specifically the Merck building, you almost, you almost can't see it. Um, maybe on the hill here looking up, you can see a little of it. But these are the various buildings that are there. Some are completely empty, like the Quest building. Um, the Geralda 7 has significant vacancies. Merck is moving out. So there's a lot of concern there. These, these taxpayers pay significant amount. I said, hey, I, pay a lot on my house in town, but goodness, 1.5 million, 1.3 million, 600,000, 500,000, they're significant. This is a picture of the Allergan Abbey building from, um, uh, from Lawanica Way. They're the, the largest paying taxpayer in town, but they had a successful tax appeal. The prior year they paid 1.5 million and that drops 1.4 million. That erosion of tax of the amount being paid by taxes in the office market is a very serious concern of ours. Um, it's one that we talked about um, a couple uh, last year and it has actually happened. Um, at the end of this presentation, I'm not gonna go through it, but we have uh, Conleyville, which is an, uh, uh, an illustrative little town that talks about how property taxes can increase if new rateables occur. The actual, the, the, the opposite, happened here. We had more tax appeals like the $100,000 loss of revenue from Geralda Farms than we had new construction in town. So the end result is, um, the illustrative example we use is nobody else came to the dinner table to, to, at the restaurant to help pay the bill. In prior years, we've had um, a significant amount of revenue um, that was generated by new rateables somebody put addition on their house. Uh, the Allegan building had that parking garage that was built and they had they were outfitted. Um, other significant um, rateables, the five houses on the corner of Kings and Division, all of those pay property taxes and the net of the loss of, uh, of tax appeals and the loss of tax um, paid there was always offset by these new rateables. This is the first year that didn't happen. We talked about it possibly happening last year, and unfortunately, it has happened. We hope that this um, is basically about zero. The, the rateable base dropped by just a, a couple thousand dollars. Um, so it's not going to have a terribly negative impact on people, but we don't get that benefit. And you'll see in a few minutes where that, that number is. But in prior years, in our budgets, we've had this extra money. And this, 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 this benefit is cumulative. If you added the 121, 125, we're getting 400, 100, We're about $450,000 of new taxes, um, of new rateables that came on from 2017 to 21. They're paying $450,000 in taxes every year. It's added to our rateable base. We didn't get that this year. It's a concern. Fortunately, the housing market we know was super strong during the pandemic, so we don't anticipate um, many successful appeals for residential, but we obviously know that the office market is so uh, appropriations, I'll go through this quickly. This should look very, very familiar. It talks about our highest, um, largest departments. Um, these, uh, five, these six departments represent over 75% of total municipal spending. So there are a lot of other departments that aren't included here, but the largest is police, then public works, fire, garbage recycling, yard waste, library, and sewage. This chart shows them all. Um, from smallest uh, to largest. And you can see that from here all the way up, all of these departments are just 25%. These six represent 75%, the dollar amounts and percentages here on this table. Um, this should look uh, familiar. It's a chart we've shown for the last few years. Um, it's important to note that the police and fire are 24 hour, seven day a week services, and that health, pension, social security, and other fringe benefits are added. Pension costs are a continuing concern. We have, uh, and I don't want to go into great detail on this, but in the state budget document, 
Um, we have inside the cap and outside the cap expenses. We can increase the capital improvement fund dollars or we can increase debt because it, uh, without a concern of hitting our appropriations cap because it's outside the cap. Pension costs are inside the pension cap. We have to find, a, or inside the appropriations cap. We have to find a way to fund them within um, the, the small amount of revenue that we're getting. And uh, they have gone up by like 5% every year. You can see the police and fire, we only have 42 members in that system. The cost per employee is $32,000 for each firefighter, for each police officer, where we, the borough of Madison, are paying $32,000. Um, for a public employee, that'd be DPW, library, all the other departments, it's $11,000. It's a significant cost. Um, this uh, bottom part of the slide talks about why that is firefighters and police officers can retire immediately. Um, after gaining 25 years, someone can be hired at age 22, retire at age 47, and immediately take their start taking their pension at 47 and get paid from 47 for the rest of their life. So if you figure their life expectancy might be to 77 years old, they worked 25 years and then they got a pension for 30 years. So they actually got a pension for more years than they actually worked. So um, that's obviously makes the pension more expensive. Um, the draft budget, uh, again, a lot of numbers and you know, we try to make it as, as simple as possible showing a number of years and, and trying to focus it. But um, uh, we, uh, this is a, a draft budget that's being advanced by the administration. And we're hopeful that council will look favorably upon this and eventually give us the go ahead to uh, draft this as our uh, municipal um, budget that goes to the state. One important point um, that's not in here, and we're going to maybe talk about this a little more later, there's $1.8 million of American Rescue Plan Act funds that the borough is going to receive. We received part of it. We're going to receive more of it. Um, that, that dollar amount will be in the state budget document. So when we finalize this document here, there will be another $1.8 million added to that document one time drop drop onto the state budget document onto this big onto this big document here um, that uh, will um, it's going to get booked in as a grant that's the way the state has asked that we book it in I didn't want to include it on this illustrative budget because we have a regular grants we get every year like the clean communities and the recycling grant and we get a grant from the Hartley Dodge trustees for um, paying of a, of a staffer here. And, and those grants are relatively static and stable. You can see they're, they're part of B23 here. Um, and to have that number explode by 1.8 million and then go down by 1.8 million, um, it just throws all the numbers off. So I, I wanted to include that as a footnote. Um, as a reminder, the council has appropriated 1.5 million of these funds for the radio system. And we're going to be talking more about that in the coming weeks, how we have to move quickly to appropriate those funds. So this is the draft budget. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Um, here's that municipal revenue we were talking about, right, being down by a million dollars. We still can't really anticipate um, uh, much more in revenue. So we're, we're actually down more from last year uh, to this year and down a million dollars from prior years. Again, property tax on new rateables. In prior years, uh, that chart would be at 100, 200, or $50,000 in that. No additional help for us, for us on the revenue lines this year. Uh, fund balance, um, we are anticipating and going to use more municipal fund balance this year um, because uh, it was generated through that uh, one-time uh, increase in lapsing appropriations. And uh, we really want to get the capital improvement line up. If uh, the fund balance uh, erodes in the following years, then we would, we would immediately just drop down the capital improvement fund. We used to be at 3.8 million. We dropped to 3.5, went to 2.8 last year. We're trying to get that number back up. We'll use um, municipal fund balance um, dollars to make that happen. Um, so that's, that's kind of the budget summary. I want to remind everyone that Madison offers tremendous services um, for the, the average home, which is an actual home that's almost the exact average of all homes in town in terms of their assessed value. 
Um, they pay property taxes of $13,500 this year under this budget, or in 2021. And the municipal portion of this tax bill um, will, uh, is $29,000 uh, or $2,968. That increase represents um, an increase of just $4 a month. So the increase that we're asking for in this year's budget to be able to fund everything we need to fund to keep all the services the same is on the average home is less than the Vente chai tea latte that I get from Starbucks once in a while. So it's not um, hopefully a heavy lift. We're obviously conscious and try to keep uh, property taxes uh, to a minimum, but uh, that's that's where we are with that. So um, takeaways, uh, we talked about it, municipal revenues, tax appeals, pension costs, um, one thing that we didn't talk about, debt service for next year for the sewage facility is going to go up by $150,000 and capital funding. Can we, can we get back to that level? Um, good news embedded within this. Um, we believe we can maintain the $2 million electric utility dividend. Um, we do have a number of major capital projects that are in the works, including the East Wing renovation um, and the um, radio project. The radio project of $1.5 million is not going to be funded by municipal dollars. It's going to be funded by federal dollars. We don't anticipate any changes in services to residents and we have money set aside and we'll be continuing to work on the water meter replacement program, which we plan on uh, really launching towards the end of this year where we will um, replace all the water meters in town and all the water modules. We did it in Chateau Theory, we wanna do it in the rest of the town. So with that, um, I'm happy to flip back um, turn the program, uh, the PowerPoint off if we want to look at each other, or um, flip back to other slides if you want to uh, uh, talk or have any questions. Probably want to. We'll uh, we'll do a split screen a little bit longer because I'm sure there'll be some questions to to go back there. But uh, as always, a great presentation and uh, bo bottom line, very uh, quick is uh, as you point out the. The lost revenues, but our biggest driver cost wise are salary related. And with a, you know, average 2% increase in salaries, uh, we're able to uh, absorb the municipal revenue loss and still have a, and hit the 2% uh, increase in uh, property tax. And, uh, good, good point, Mayor. I want to point out that, you know, this is, this is $10 million that's going up by 2%. Property taxes is 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 um three hundred thousand dollar increase. The budget is going up by three percent. A lot of that's being driven by the capital improvement fund, but the budget is thirty three million. If we increase property taxes by two percent, it's only on half of only on half of our revenue, less than half. Of our revenue. So, yeah. Other uh, questions, comments, uh, Bob, and then uh, Deb, and then Maureen. This isn't so much a question, it's just a comment. Um, nobody really knows for sure what's going to happen in the coming years, you know, with the pandemic and people, you know, commuting to the city and whatnot. The fact that you've been able to put together what I consider a very frugal and realistic budget, and you've recognized the drops in revenues and potential expenses and still maintain the services that we have. I think it's a credit to you and the administration for the good work that's been done here. You know, I couldn't really question anything that you've presented here because it all makes good sense to me, especially what you've noted as the uh, expense drivers. And to a large extent, we don't have a lot of control over them. You know, some of it were bound by contracts and negotiations with the labor unions and others, you know, there's work to be done in town. You can't let it go like road improvements and things of that nature. So I really give you a lot of credit for this budget. I think it's very sound and it's frugal and let's hope that next year will be better than this year. That's all we can really hope for at this point. Thank, thank you. you, Councilman. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bounce it back to you guys and say thank you to you and past councils, Carmela, Austri, or Councilwoman Vitale, Councilwoman Bailey and others that um, uh, made sure that we had um, adequate fund balance because that that's what helped us get through this and hopefully that's 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 going to allow us to keep the services the way. All right, uh, Deb and then Maureen. Uh, Maureen, you actually want to go first and then I'll ask because I have a whole bunch. Okay, I have I have two questions. 
One is on the, the, um, the rescue plan. When do we anticipate getting guidelines on how we can use those funds? And secondly, what type of um, protection are we gonna take to, to buy the radio system and with a possible supply chain problems? Sure. Um, good questions. So it was, it was very interesting. This is uh, all of the, this is my ARPA file here with all the rules and regulations. And the government came out with interim final rules, but they said they're not the final final rules, so you have to wait. So we waited and waited and waited, and they finally came out with the final final rules, which fortunately were made a lot of this paperwork um, less onerous for us. It just came out, um, I think, at the end of December. So uh, we now have clear guidance on how um, we're to spend it. And we actually have been speaking to the state, uh, to the Division of Local Government Services. This year, we have our budget under state review, which is something that happens once every three years. Fiscally sound municipalities like Madison are not under state review every year or under once every three years. So this is a state review year. So we're talking to them about that. And um, as I mentioned, the ARPA funds are going to be considered a grant. And there, uh, and you and I were talking about this, which is how you knew to ask this question about the about supply chain issues and timing. Uh, we want to buy um, radio uh, equipment with that. And the contracts we want to use, we buy them under a state contract where the price is set. Those contracts expire at the end of April. So if we don't put in the order before the end of April, we're going to miss out on that contract. No doubt prices are going up, right? On all supply chain issues, prices are, prices are going up. So we want to accelerate that. The Division of Local Government Services um, said, well, you're going to insert this in the budget like I talked about. It's going to be inserted in a state budget document, $1.8 million in, in the ARPA funds. But they said, for belts and suspenders, you should pass an emergency appropriation, which will be an amendment to your temporary budget. So that grant would be added as an amendment to our temporary budget to be able to appropriate those funds. That way, if something happens during the state review, by the way, the same person that was giving us this guidance is also in charge of the state review. Sometimes things get held up. We can't, for whatever reason, pass our budget at the end of April. We can still appropriate those funds. And on the April 25th council meeting, we will definitely be passing a resolution to uh, contract to appropriate the radio equipment before the end of the month or so we don't, we, we can get it at, at the lower price. I hope, I hope that I explained that well. It's a complicated topic. Yeah, you did. Okay. Thank you. Do you Deb, you want to go or do you want to yield to others before? <laughs> I was gonna, I'll go last. I'll go last Eric, with all my list. Eric, did I see your hand? Uh... No, I, we, can, we can let Deb loose with her list. <laughs> right. It's not, all right. We'll 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 just we'll go go to Deb and uh, <laughs> others can uh, follow up if necessary. All right. As Several questions. Um, some for clarification, some for explanation. Um, regarding Geralda, there are a couple of questions. How concerned are we about the tax appeals, and do we have enough in reserve to cover those tax appeals? Um, could fund balance help us protect us from some of those tax appeals? I'll let you answer those and then I have one more Geralda related question. Okay, um, so some of these tax appeals go back a number of years and we'll throw in rheology in there too, right? I think there are number two um, rateable lists for the people. 99% they're number two. Got yep, rheology is number two, $1.3 million. They have an appeal that's out for, um, Ray's always got a better memory than I do, but I believe it's at least four years. If, if they win that appeal, we're paying back money for two, three, four years. We're gonna be paying back a lot of money. So this budget does have an increased amount to go into the tax appeal reserve. It's the dollar amount that we put into a pot to protect us and to be able to pay. If you um, uh, see over the course of the year, you'll see when we have resolutions that say we're accepting this settlement for tax appeals, we're paying X amount that gets paid out of the tax appeal reserve. Um, it, is, it is a big concern. Uh, count, uh, the planning board um, with the guidance of the mayor and, and Austri and, and Rachel and the, plan, and the planning board um, passed uh, new uses at Geralda Farms, which is really helpful that um, 
we can hopefully sustain some of the uh, uh, property values over there. But the bottom line is we're, we're, we're going to lose, we're going to lose appeals and we're going to have to pay out a lot of money. What that is, I'm not sure. Fair enough. Also in there, and I could remember, be remembering wrong, but with Atlantic Health, which I think is the Avi Geralda Far Geralda Five, at one point, did you not talk about that they were trying to get something that would make them a tax free? Um, good, good question. Yeah, we did talk about that. So they're not. Um, they're they're like the sixth or seventh highest paying taxpayer. So they're not on they're not on the list of the top six. They're just they're just below. Um, and uh, that that's the corner building here. They recently built um, a small building there. They may build others. Um, there is a, uh, a a bill that passed the legislature that allows um, entities that are considered hospitals to uh, not have to pay any property taxes, um, just may pay a small fee per bed. Um, this is really uh, gonna be a legal question, whether they can count a rehab facility as a hospital, and whether it is a not-for-profit or for-profit. And so that is, a, that is an exposure and a concern of ours. It's also a concern, um, depending on what they develop there. They just say, Atlantic Health says, we wanna move our corporate offices to Geralda Farms. Yay, I hope they heard that. I hope they do that because um, it's offices and, and that's that's a, a rateable and it's a beautiful location. I'd like to sell them on it. Um, but uh, if, if they decide to move medical offices that can be classified as, uh, as uh, hospitals, then you're exactly right. We could be in a lot of trouble and have additional erosion of our rateable base there. All right, moving on, our fund balance has gone from 4.2 million in 2016 to 5.8 million this year. Are we becoming overly reliant on that? And what happens if it does drop um, next year? Uh, so we're, we'll, um, we'll look at this number here, um, which is kind of what you're referring to, the use of fund balance in the municipal budget. And yes, it's it's gone up. It was 2018 and 17, it was even less. Um, uh, I think it's, I think I'm okay with using this number. I probably, uh, in the beginning, I wasn't so sure, Rain, I had a lot of conversations about this, um, but I decided I'm okay with it because we're using 300,000 of that money to um, uh, increase capital improvement, right? So this 5.8 million, 300,000 of that cause the, is, is increasing the capital improvement fund. So if we backed off, 300,000 kept that at 2.8, our fund balance could be at 5.5, which is more in hailing distance. Um, fund balance is, is like trying to like land a, freight, a freighter by being able to touch the controls um, and steer the boat one time, once a year, and then you just let it go from there. And so it, it's, we don't know what weather is gonna hit, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen, but um, so it's, it's very hard to predict, but our, I think we're I think we're fine, um, but we do have to monitor it. And if we do have less fund balance in the out years, we would reduce capital improvement fund um, back back down. All right, and then with state aid, we I know we've been flat at this um, eight hundred eight thousand five hundred twenty nine. How long have we been flat, and do we expect to ever see it go back up? Uh, so this is line B six here. If you can see my little arrow, and uh, I think that number has been that way for 13 years. So obviously our budget, our appropriations continues to go up. Our costs, our pension bills that the state sends us continue to go up, but our state aid um, has, not, ha has not gone up for 13 years. So the percentage of our budget that's funded by state aid continues to drop. Um, I, I don't see it. I, I, We'd hear about it if the state was in such bad shape they had to reduce it. Last year was a bellwether that we had the pandemic and they were able to keep our state aid. But I don't anticipate, I, I don't think we should in any way, shape or form think it's gonna go up. All right, two more and then I'm done. Two more. Um, with the debt service in line B33, is the MRC debt included in that? And also the joint meeting, when does that, when do we start repaying that new debt that we're acquiring? Uh, good question. So um, referenced um, in your report, we had the MRC debt, which is paid for from 
the Open Space Trust Fund, Open Space uh, Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund. So that debt service does not include the MRC. That debt service line B33 here is for uh, debt associated with the, that we currently have on the books for the sewage treatment plant and debt we have for the renovation, which happened nine or 10 years ago to Hartley Dodge and the construction of the new public safety building. That's, that's what that debt is. We did have, we did incur increasing debt this year. So there's um, 130 of about $300,000 in new debt this year. Our debt would have gone down a little bit instead it went up because we are paying a portion of the new debt associated with the new um, multi-million dollar um, improvements at the sewage treatment plant. But we have another $160,000 we're anticipating um, in, in ne next year that we will have to pay. So that debt service number alone will go up $160,000. All right, and then last question, we've talked a little bit about supply chain. Other than the radio system, and I'm assuming the water meter project, anything else that might be impacted um, by supply so chain issues? So many things are being impacted by it. Every day I talk, and talk to Kevin O'Keefe for purchasing today, uh, we're having troubles getting transformers. The transformers we want, you know, we can get the, we, we can get one kind, but we want the right kind that we like. And we're having trouble getting those to the point where like a year or so out in terms of getting orders in for those. Um, also, the big surprise from a couple of weeks ago was, hey, we want to get the water meter and module project going. And the modules are only made by only a couple of companies that can make, that make these modules that can bid on it. We're going to have to go out to bid. And they're like, yeah, that's like seven to nine months to get that. So even though I'm hoping to get the RFP out, um, not the RFP, the um, uh, bid out for that work in the next two or three months, I'm working with uh, Ray and, and Kevin on that. Once we award that contract, it's going to be seven months. So that's why I was anticipating that that project won't start until um, the end of the year. Great. Thank you. Thank you for all your work on the budget and all the time you take. I know with me and everybody else to understand this craziness of a budget and how it works. Other uh, comments or questions? No. All right. So it I, sounds like we have a fairly good, I think, a comfort level as far as you're on the right track and to continue the work in this direction. I'm trying to figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. All Thank right. You. Very good. Thank you. And now we move on to ordinances for hearing. Will the clerk please read the statement? Yes, the ordinance is scheduled for hearing, was introduced by title and passed on first reading at the regular meeting of the council held on January the 24th, 2022. It was posted and filed according to law, and copies were made available to the general public requesting same. I call up ordinance 3 2022 for second read and ask the clerk to read said ordinance by title. Ordinance 3 2022, ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $80,000 from the General Capital Improvement Fund for the purchase of handicapped exterior door replacement and accessories. I open the hearing. Anyone in the public wishing to comment on this ordinance? And I see uh, Claire, so we'll bring you in again. It's just commenting on this ordinance, which is the uh, funding for uh, handicap exterior door replacement and accessories. And the hand has gone down. We'll uh, be back with that later. All right. And again, uh, I see no other hands up. I close the hearing. And uh, as was pointed out when we introduced this, a um, um, good part of this was related to um, Hurricane uh, Ida damage and we're hoping to re recoup some of the, uh, if not all the expenses, well, probably not all, but uh, most of the expenses related to this. Mayor, I move ordinance 3-2022. Second. Any council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Ms. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Right. 
declare ordinance 3-2022 adopted and finally passed and ask the clerk to publish notice, notice there of a newspaper and file the ordinance in accordance with the law. And now we're on to our second of invitations for uh, discussion. This is when you make comment on any topic. Same rules apply. Click uh, the hand to raise your hand and um, or star nine if you're on the phone. When you are recognized, state your name and your uh, town of residence and then try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we will give you a one minute uh, grace period. Uh, Claire Whitcomb. Uh, hi there, uh, Claire Whitcomb, 12 Fairwood Road. Um, thank you very much. Um, now that I've got my timing right. Um, I just wanna say I really love Zoom. I could actually see Jim's presentation and I could look at all that little tiny type and I could tell what's going on. And when I saw, when I was in person at the council, I even moved to the front row and I couldn't figure it out. I mean, I really could not navigate it. So this is really great. Um, the other reason why I love Zoom uh, and, and hybrid meetings, I was able to call in to attend the Chatham Township meeting uh, where they passed the Drew Forest resolution and make a comment. And um, Mayor Conley, I missed your opening remarks, which I gather included um, our Drew Forest Valentine because I was um, attending the Chatham Borough meeting and Tori Van Wee gave a, um, a climate presentation and uh, Chatham is going to go for um, the gold, uh, whatever it is, gold, whatever standard of sustainable Jersey. So they're going to work towards that, which is really tremendous. Uh, they talked about solar panels on the sewage treatment plant. Oh, Gold Star and Energy, that's what it is. They talked about community solar. They gave a shout out to Madison for um, our climate work and the uh, partnership with the mayors. Um, they talked a lot about teamwork um, and uh, they are uh, have a climate resolution before the council. They may have passed it by now. And they passed a Drew Forest resolution supporting our um, efforts toward, to work towards, um, Madison's efforts to work towards a, a conservation purchase of the 53 acre forest. And this follows, um, Chatham Township as noted, and the Environmental Commissions of Harding and Mars Township have also passed a resolution. And we are uh, reaching out to the Environmental Commissions of other towns to sort of start that process. Um, so I also, okay, I think, oh, so the, the Valentine that we sent to the council and the mayor has a lot of signatures on it. They were gathered at the Mars uh, Winter Market in Convent Station, which I recommend everybody go to. It's so incredibly easy. It's flat, it's open, the parking is, you don't have to lug your stuff like 35 miles. And uh, the vendors are all cold and so happy to see you. It's really great. So um, we, We've been having a lot of substantive conversations. A lot of people in Mars County don't know about the Drew Forest. They're like, oh, where can I sign immediately? Because all of us are experiencing extensive overdevelopment and, um, and we're, we're all experiencing a loss of tree canopy. And with all this climate work that we're doing, um, we have to acknowledge that the roles of um, the forest majestic trees are critical to um, carbon sequestration and to um, municipal and regional climate planning. And if we lose our tree canopy, we're going to um, not be able to reduce the, the carbon emissions that we're working for towards reducing with you know the solar One power port project. Okay, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And I'm sorry you missed the beginning of the meeting, but uh, yes, I did show off the uh, our Valentine. And I don't know if you can see it on your screen right now, but there it is right at my side with many great signatures. Thank you. And now we'll call up uh, G. Lewis. Uh, again, uh, as you come up, please state your full name and uh, town of residence, and then try to keep your comments to three minutes, but we'll give you one minute grace. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my name is Gordon Lewis. I live at Two Glen Wild Circle. Uh, one comment, I appreciate the uh, proclamation that you read earlier about Black History Month. I think it should also be noted, um, and I didn't attend the last meeting and maybe it was because of the timing, 
uh, but January 27th is um, designated by UNESCO as International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I believe that's a day that probably um, deserves some recognition from the, uh, the town also. Um, what I'm really here to speak about though is the, uh, the New York Post article uh, that received quite a bit of attention. Um, I, I was really taken aback by the, um, the way the town reacted to it. I saw the statement on Facebook. I found that to be uh, a little bit misleading. Um, much of the article, um, uh, much of the statement referred to the article as an opinion piece. It was actually a video um, that was uh, obtained through a Freedom of Information Act by Rob Astorino, the Westchester uh, County Executive. A number of people were identified in the video. Um, I, I don't think uh, calling it an opinion piece was, um, you know, did it justice. And I would like to hear um, what your investigation has turned up um, in contact with your, uh, your federal counterparts. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, as we uh, close this comment period, I'll uh, bring, give you an update on that. So, anyone else wishing to comment, please raise your hand. Tom, welcome back. Hello again, Mayor and Council. Uh, I am also anxious to hear your response, Mayor. I think that you did a good job with your information that you passed on to the borough. Um, let's see what you have to say in addition to that. So. A couple of things I was going to comment on, something separate. I didn't know there was a budget presentation tonight. So thanks, Jim. Fantastic job. Very extensive, very detailed. Um, you know, you, you really have a handle on managing the, the, the future of uh, controlling the spending in the town and collecting revenue. What One observation I made, and I don't see it on the screen now, and I didn't know if there was anywhere online to find it. But when you talk about the... Um, additional rateables coming to the borough, there probably is a way to estimate what we might be getting from some of the new construction. There's not a tremendous amount, but I, I was just thinking off the top of my head, there's a house across the street from Dodge. Bob, you know about that house, a few houses over from you. And then there's a new house on the construction on Hillside, a house just sold on Woodcliffe. Uh, there's a house on Kings Road, the two family house that backs up to the train tracks. There's a few places, so maybe we'll be able to recover a little bit of the loss of $100,000 from the Geralda property. And there might be more coming. I don't really know, but but hopefully there, you know, there is some outlook to gain some new, and then Lincoln Place, who knows when that's gonna come in to the borough's uh, tax rateables when they put the new building up in the movie theater place. The other thing I uh, wanted to ask, who is gonna be lobbying with Trenton to try and get an increase to our state aid? To just stay flat for 13 years, doesn't seem like we have a real partnership with the state of New Jersey. I have, remember hearing in the past that Madison sends about $40 million a year in our, in our income taxes to Trenton. I think that's right, but if anybody on the council knows differently, please correct me. And between the schools, which I believe the Board of Education gets about 2.6 million, and now the borough's getting $800,000, you have $3.4 million being returned to us when we're sending $40 million to the state. Somebody's got to bring that to Governor Murphy's attention that there's a little bit of an inequity there. He might have some reasons for it, but I still think something that should be made public and hear what their response is for not giving the borough of Madison more support with some aid from the state. Um, another thing I wanted to comment on, maybe there are some areas that we can look at in the future to generate a little extra revenue. So one area which I, I can personally um, address is uh, merchant employee parking. And maybe that's included in the number that Jim had given us. I don't know if it is, but, uh, and maybe, maybe Councilman Hoover can tell us too. I, I was guessing that at any time during the day, there's 250 merchant employees working during the day who should have permits for their parking, if they're all parking their cars, obviously. So if we just charge them $150, that could be almost $40,000 in parking revenue just from the central business district. And, and I think a lot of businesses would agree they have to pay 
for their employees to park somewhere in lieu of them moving their cars around or parking outside of the central business district on some of these side streets. Um, the other area we could hopefully raise some more money is uh, as we, what, what, one minute. Um, what I said, I had eight minutes from the last meetings. What happened, Bob? Sorry. Yeah, Take we can't do that. We, oh. we, we, we can't do a fund balance on uh, comments, sure? but yeah, sorry. It's impossible for me to talk to you in four minutes about what's transpired in two weeks, yeah. but I'll try. Right. I'm right. gonna, yep. Okay. Okay. Another way to make some money is electric revenue. I talked about this before. I think we've all talked about it. We have to start to promote more use of our electricity in the borough, whether it's giving some incentives for any kind of electric appliances, blowers, which the uh, uh, Environmental Commission is a big fan of, uh, more electric cars charging in the borough using electricity from the grid. It, it's got to be some nice size revenue opportunity. The last thing I want to talk about, and it came to my mind tonight because I went to pick up food for Valentine's Day in the Staples Mall at Begum, right? There's 10 DoorDash and Uber Eats guys parked outside, all idling their cars. I go inside and it's taken a little while for us to check out. So for almost 10 minutes, cars are idling. There's so many places around town that are abusing this. You have Dunkin' Donuts, you have Quick Check, you have, you have a, a Rosedale skating rink. Parents go and let their kids skate, which is fantastic. They're sitting in their cars and their cars are idling. And I asked the environmental commission in the borough, why do we put some signs up? And somebody says to me, well, I don't think signs are gonna make a difference. What's gonna make a difference? How are we gonna get a message to all of Dunkin' Donuts customers that they shouldn't be idling their cars? And all these Uber Eats drivers, who's gonna go and enforce something we're so concerned about losing trees in the Drew Forest, which I am also. And, and we're, we're, at, we're, at, we're at time. Sorry. Wait, we're not saving the environment. Thank you, Tom. And I, I, I share your uh, frustration and um, pain as far as the idling. It, it drives me crazy. It is against the law uh, to idle. Um, so what... Uh, I will uh, we'll have some uh, discussions here, maybe with the Environmental Commission and staff and uh, police on how, how we can do this. But I think for, for one, a um, educating the shop owners, uh, you know, Uber Eats is a, um, and the like is a, in the grand scheme of things, fairly new. And we know there is a lot of issues around uh, Uber Eats and uh, how that whole thing is managed. and. Uh, they, they need to have respect for our environment and um, there is no reason to keep a car running out in front, whether you are delivering the food or picking up for your family. Turn the car off, save, save our air and save our environment. Uh, a couple other things you mentioned, the state aid, um, you know, we certainly can lobby. I, I know the, and, and you've probably heard this too, the priority in the coming years is gonna be on the education side, the funding of, um, of the schools through property taxes is what the true burden is. So um, the, um, the school district has seen the increase in state aid um, and we'll see what is coming in, in the future years. But as we point out, if we have pension bills and other unfunded mandates, it's the pressure is gonna come right, be handed right on to our uh, residents. And uh, if there is no one else wishing to comment, we will, I will uh, share an update on the, uh, the post article. Seeing none, we close this close this part of the meeting. And so, just a, a, a an update on uh, what was going on. Um, I do want to touch a little bit on the our social media response um, that uh, residents uh, such as M Mr. Lewis um, thought was too dismissive as uh, as it came out earlier in that day. And I'm sorry that some took it that way. You know, I certainly take the job seriously. Um, this was in an opinion piece. Um, there was it was based on some video and um, recordings, but uh, what we saw were only partial. So, to be honest, and to this day, I have no idea why Madison, New Jersey, was mentioned in there. In fact, if you uh, read the quote, it seemed seemed to be very out of place as they talked about Maryland, Virginia, and Madison, New Jersey. Um, so, when that happened that day, it um, you know we did have and I. I you know, uh, 
did feel we put out there as being dismissive because there was no reason for us to be mentioned in that context. And so we wrote it off as a, um, you know, someone mentioned Madison and uh, we don't know what the connection was. Um, so, but that said, we did take this seriously. So we did reach out to the um, our federal government and we now have a better understanding of what was described. And so let me bring you up to date as to uh, what has been going on. And, um, but we still have, again, have no idea why we were mentioned in that column. Um, so here is uh, some of the things we have learned, both US immigration and uh, customs enforcement, which is ICE, and the Department of Health and Human Services fly uh, what you would call undocumented Im immigrants or what is called und undocumented immigrants to different locations in the United States. ICE is handling the adults. The HHS is responsible for children. Both use the same contractors. The, and this was a contractor that was um, mentioned in this column. And this has actually been going on for multiple years. Uh, so it is more than just a past year thing. This has been going on through um, previous administrations. Uh, for HHS, this means getting children to vetted sponsors or families. And so this is um, children that have uh, immigrated into the United States and are they're trying to get them back, reconnect with families or um, connected uh, with uh, sponsors. And so that is uh, how HHS does it. For ICE, it is often relocating adults to centers which have capacity from centers that did not have capacity. So they're moving them around the country based on where the capacity is. Uh, an HHS flight with children did go through Westchester Airport in August on that, around the time that was mentioned in that column. Um, children, this again, since it was HHS, this flight was with children and, and similar to any parts of the country. And so they were most likely being connected with families and sponsors that had been vetted and throughout the greater New York area. And we are, and are not aware of any that may have come to Madison. And we certainly uh, were and are not aware of any buses coming to Madison. So uh, that is where we, where we are right now. And we should be, you know, as we get more information from the uh, federal government, we will continue to share it, but uh, that's the update. I know it's uh, frustrating to some residents and uh, it's frustrating to me to see Madison appear in that uh, column with no knowledge as to why we should have been there. So we were now moving on to uh, introductory ordinances. Will the uh, clerk please read the statement? Ordinance is scheduled for first reading, have a hearing date set for February the 28th, 2022. All will be published in the Madison Eagle, posted on the bulletin board and made available to members of the public requesting copies. You're muted, Bob. Thank you. My uh, binder fell on the floor, making a big noise, so I muted myself and then lost uh, track, so again. Uh, I call it uh, ordinances for first reading. Ask the borough clerk to read so, said ordinances by title. Ordinance 4-2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison appropriating $456,987 from the General Capital Improvement Fund as matching funds for the Madison Public Library Construction Bond Grant Award and authorizing execution of all grant agreement documentation. Mayor, I move ordinance. 4-2022. Second. Council discussion. Uh, Jim, I know you're off screen right now. If, if you can, uh, or I guess you have these numbers in front of me, but uh, talk about the um, various funding sources. The sides, our mar matching grant, the grant from the state, but also the library, uh, friends of the library and other sources are helping fund this. So this is a... Uh, I don't know if you have I those numbers. You've got a better memory than I do on specific numbers like this, but um, yes, that's exactly correct. Man. There's lots of okay, so and, stuff, but in, in this regard, um, we're going to basically pre-fund through the issuance of the general capital and then be able to get reimbursed. Thank you. Any further council discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. 
Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. All right. I call up Ordinance 5 2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison amending Chapter 195-32.4 of the Madison Borough Code entitled CBD-1, CBD-2 Central Business District Zone Regulations. Mayor, I move Ordinance 5-2022. Mayor, I second it. Council discussion? And this is uh, related to uh, removal of parking structures and on private owned properties that uh, it would currently are permitted uses. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. Ordinance 6 2022. Ordinance of the Borough of Madison, mending and supplementing Chapter 112 of the Madison Borough Code entitled Historic District Preservation to incorporate voluntary compliance historic preservation design guidelines as an appendix to Article 112 7C1. Mayor, I move Ordinance 6 2022. Mayor, I second the ordinance. Any council discussion? Again, just to oh, yep, no, go, I was go, just going to say to to clarify this, um, the current uh, current code has an appendix. I believe it's a document from 1999 that has some uh, historic preservation guidelines in it. This document was put together by the Historic Preservation Commission uh, and is a very extensive document. It's 90 some pages um, with photos and gives some great. Uh, information for anyone looking to develop in the borough of Madison, whether they're in an historic district or just looking to better weave their project into the nature of the borough as a whole. Uh, Deb? Uh, just a quick question, and I guess I'm going to throw it to Maureen since you're the liaison to HPC, but I don't know if you'll have an answer. Uh, like Eric said, it is a massive document. I'm just thinking, is there a way to obviously not a one pager, which would be great, but even like four or five pages to, to hide, like if somebody wants to use it, that's a lot to go through. So I'm all for it. And I think keeping this would be good, but I just wonder if maybe something with some key points or pointing people an index, pointing people to where they need to go for different things might make sense given the size of the document. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And uh, I'll take it up with the historic preservation uh, committee. And there are sections of it that are appropriate for depending on what you're doing. So you might, you know, if you have the many pages, you can uh, go through to the particular section. And there are a lot of pictures in it too. So, but it, uh, it, is, it, is, it is very, it is very complete. I mean, and, and it hopefully will, as we see development in the in the downtown historic area, it will give um, guidelines so people can. Uh, keep with the historic character of the town. Uh, Rachel? I'll just add that I would characterize this as a fairly technical document. It's it's for a licensed professional to use, you know, an architect or perhaps a contractor. And so the detailed nature of it, I think is appropriate for who, it, you know, the audience. Um, and it's true, it is written, if you're just doing a window replacement, you can just go to the window section, for instance. So. I think um, it, it, the level of detail and uh, the way that it's organized uh, makes sense for the, the audience that it's intended for. And one last comment, Mayor. Oh. Uh, just, you know, in addition to the work that HPC has put in on this document, which has been extensive, um, it's also been endorsed by uh, the planning board and also the zoning board in their individual meetings, so. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, the planning board, we recently had a hearing related to a, uh, what will be a, a tear down and rebuild of, in, in a neighborhood with uh, historic homes. And the initial comments were, you know, this design is not quite right, you know, it was, but now had this document been in place, the, the uh, applicant probably would have saved a whole lot of time because they would have designed something that would have been appropriate for the site. That's where we ended up. But um, now we have a much better tool to get us to that finish line. Any other comments? Roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? 
Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. All right, consent agenda resolutions. Will the clerk please read the statement? Consent agenda resolutions will be enacted with a single motion. Any resolution requiring expenditure is supported by a certification of availability of funds. Any resolution requiring discussion will be removed from the consent agenda. All resolutions will be reflected in full in the minutes. Mayor, I move consent agenda resolution 62-2022 through consent agenda resolution R83-2022. Right, to any uh, discussion or any that need to be pulled separately? Hey, roll call vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Li uh, I apologize. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. All right, there is no unfinished business. Um, approval of vouchers. Will the clerk please or voucher? Yes, for the current fund, $445,431.02. For the general capital fund, $66,260.34. For the electric operating fund, $175,329.31. And for the electric capital fund, $6,346.94. The water operating fund, $44,145.19. The water capital fund $750. For the trust, $9,428.30. The total is $747,691.10. I have a motion for the vouchers, please. Mayor, I'll move the approval of the vouchers. I'll second. Any discussion? What? Roll call vote, vote, please. Ms. Byrne? Yes. Mr. Hoover? Yes. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Ehrlich? Yes. Mr. Landrigan? Yes. Mr. Range? Yes. All right, under uh, new business, I'd like to uh, make the following appointments requesting council confirmation to the Community Garden Advisory Committee, Arlene Lloyd of uh, Wilmer Street, three-year term through December 31, 2024, and um, Jennifer, Marquardt, uh, 2 Westerly Ave Avenue, three-year term, uh, December 31st, 2024. And then for our ad hoc committee that was established by resolution earlier this uh, year, this is the 2022 Climate Action Ad Hoc Committee members um, from Sustainable Madison, Peter Freed, Lisa Jordan, Kathy Cacaval, Council Member Rachel Ehrlich, Borough Staff Jim Burnett, and Environmental Commission members Claire Whitcomb, and Kirsten Wallenstein. Can I have a uh, motion to approve those appointments? So moved. I'll second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous, okay. And the last thing is um, happy Valentine's Day all, what's left of it, enjoy. And a reminder, our next meeting will remain uh, virtual and we'll be, we're planning to be back in person on March 14th. And uh, I have a motion to adjourn. Mayor, I move we adjourn the meeting. Second and all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all. Take care.